about if this works closure for game development so um, this is a bit of a, a personal passion of mine I, I code games for fun I'm not a professional game developer I've never published a serious game this is just a, a hobby I do in my spare time but I found closure has been a very interesting language for, for game development and I wanted to share a bit about um, some of the stuff I've been doing, but also some, you know, get more into the code and the tips and tricks and how you can do some things in Clojure, which are quite cool. Um, so uh, that's, t that's today's topic. Um, so a, a bit of... Uh, who, 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 by the way, who, who's, who's done game coding before? Two? Okay. Well, I'm going to try and sell it to you. If, 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 um, if by the end of the talk, you all, everyone decides, hey, actually, I'd I like to try a bit of that, then my, my job is done, yeah? Because my personal story, I learned to code because I like computer games, and I wanted to know how to make them. So when I was eight years old, I was an extremely lucky boy, and, and my dad bought me one of these, which is an Atari 800XL. Um, this was a fantastic computer. Um, it had 64K RAM. I, it could store one low-resolution JPEG, basically. That, that was it. And it definitely couldn't store enough, co enough code to decode a JPEG. So, but you could at least store a JPEG. It had 1.77 megahertz CPU. That's not gigahertz, megahertz. <laughs> yeah. It had eight bit registers, yeah, so none of these sixty four bit nonsense you got you know one character in a register, and that was it if you wanted to if you wanted to have a number bigger than one hundred and twenty seven you had to use two registers sorry yeah um, it's about so it's about modern pcs are about one hundred thousand times more CPU power based on mips mips instructions per second about 400,000 times more RAM, you know, that's the sort of kind of idea. But I loved it, and you could make, you could make games with this, yeah? And the, one of the great things about game programming is it really does teach you some different ways of programming, how to program efficiently, how to make sure there's good performance, how to think about, you know, the interactions with the user, how do you make it responsive, how do you make it fun, how do you make it interesting? And, in fact, the data structures and the programming techniques you use in game programming are actually quite sophisticated, I, I'm willing to say that a, 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 pretty much any computer game puts most enterprise apps to shame in terms of you know, complexity and the actual engineering um, uh, expertise required to build them. That's a screenshot of one of the Atari XL games. That's a game called Zybex. I think the screen resolution was something like, you know, 160 times 200 or something like that. It had some very strange resolution. And I think technically, the, technically it could only handle four colours yeah, at a time. But you could, because it was so, because it was, because um, the, the, you know, the, the processor was going so slowly, you could basically trick it. And you could, you could change registers while it was drawing the screen and it would change the colour of things. So that's how they managed to make this line in different colours from these lines. Yeah? <laughs> you just do all these stupid tricks to try and make, it, try and, try and make anything work at all. Um, so, um, what, what do you need to make a game? And sort of bring it back a bit more to the sort of closure cons, um, uh, context. Um, a game is actually essentially very simple. Yeah, you first have to set up the game. What's what's going to run? What does it look like? What's the environment you want to um, what you want to run? You need to get some input in the game. What's the user doing? What are they trying to do? Are they moving? Are they not moving? Are they entering a command? You then need to update but based on the input. That's going to change change the state of the game. And once the state of the game's changed, you need to report the results back to the user output display display the game. Um, and you just loop. Yeah, so the games basically have this main loop where you go round and round and round and round and round. And what's quite interesting about this is you can see all of these as basically um, state transition functions. 
yeah, that, 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 that operate in the, in the context of the game. So you're starting off with some configuration. That might be, you know, the game options or the environment or some parameters in the game. Um, you've got some, some function that creates the initial state of the universe, the, the game world, if you like. That could be a pure function, yeah? Quite often it is not a pure function. Anyone, anyone can guess why? Persistence. Say? Persistence. Like from previous... It could be, yeah. Persistence is one reason, yeah. yeah. Uh, environment. Environment, yeah, you could read something from the environment. Although if the environment, it could still be a pure function from the environment to the state. Video buffer. Video buffer, yeah, could, could be some weirdness in the setup. Um, usually I've found it's randomness, in fact. So quite often when you're uh, in games, you often... At, some of you came to my talk on um, closure graphics before, in generative graphics. Yeah. Um, I, so I talked about how you can use random number generators to uh, create these, you know, images and fractals and this kind of thing. Uh, you might want to use those in your game setup function when you're generating the world. And in fact, the, one, the game I'm going to demonstrate actually has a, has, has a bit of that. Um, but it could be a pure function, but maybe you decide you want to put some randomness in or something like that to make it a bit more interesting. Um, input then, I mean, this is... This is a function that just reads from the world. So it's an impure function because you're getting external input. But you're getting some kind of an event. An event here could be a key press or a mouse button press or someone moves a joystick to the left or to the right, any of these kind of things. But then the sort of the core of uh, the game, and I think the most interesting function of all, is when you take the state of the game, yeah, the current state of the game, plus an event, what just happened, and you transition that to the next, um, next state in the game. And that can be a pure function, yeah? And um, uh, so you've, you've basically got an immutable state of the world, you run it through a pure function with whatever the event is, and you get a new state of the world. And that's actually quite nice from a functional programming perspective. We can actually reason about this. Yeah? You can also imagine the entire running of the game. It's like reducing over a whole bunch of events and then creating like a chain of different states of the world. And then output is basically you take that state um, that came from the update function and you get some side effects. So typically those side effects are drawing the screen. Yeah? So you've got some internal data structure which represents the state of the world you run it through uh, then a rendering function, and the rendering function paints the, sc the screen. Now, in most games, you actually throw away the whole screen and repaint it every single frame, yeah? So it paints one frame, it creates a buffer in the background, it paints a new frame, once that, that frame's finished, it throws away the first frame, displays that one, and, it, and so on, it just creates new frames continuously. Some, some games do try and retain the old the old screen and just update the regions that they need to but that's it's, it's more complicated and it turns out it's actually harder to do it that way on modern graphics cards you might as well just redraw the whole frame in one go so um, you might also have other sound effect, uh, side effects like sound yeah if you want to kick off any sound effects or um, I don't know maybe you've got some you know flashing lights around wh whatever Okay, so that's that's basically the core. That's basically the core concept of a of, of a of a game loop, and this loop is running at. In an action game, you'll be running it probably at the same same speed as your um, as your screen refresh, or you could run it like once every two screen refreshes if you want to, uh, but you've got it running on a on a sort of fast iterative schedule. You could also, in some games, like a turn-based game, will run on a slower schedule. In fact, they'll actually probably only run this loop when actually something happens, when actually an event, event occurs. So I'm going to talk about this in the context of um, a little game I made. It was co it's called Alchemy, and it's a closure roguelike game. Now, Rogue, for those... Anyone heard of the game Rogue? No? 
Oh, that's, that's sad. That's sad. <laughs> um, I, I don't blame you because I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm an oldie. I, 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 but Rogue was, a, Rogue was a, a classic game. It came on some of the old, very old, uh, early PCs, you know, like the very early IBM PCs. And it was basically one of the first games that actually had exploration of like a lost dungeon and finding secret treasure, this kind of, this kind of concept. And because you didn't actually have any graphics then, yeah, you just had character terminals, yeah, like a, a shell, effectively. You had no graphics, and they wanted to play it on these, these terminal emulators. So the idea of the game was, well, it's all rendered in, um, it's all rendered in, uh, in ASCII, yeah? Uh, and I think it was one of the first games that ever used an ASCII colour terminal. And the idea, well, that's, so the ca your, your hero is like an at sign, uh, an S is for snake. Uh, these are like coloured cells, which are walls. Um, those little things are, are some kind of food. But it's basically, it's basically all an, enti an, an entirely uh, ASCII-based game. But it's still interactive, and it's, it's, it's fun. Um, the... This was actually, they do, they do a, con there's basically, this has spawned a whole community of people who just like making roguelike games, because they're quite fun, they're quite interesting to build, they've got a lot of actually interesting game development things, but they're not too hard. So this one was for a seven day roguelike competition, you've got one week to write a roguelike game. I think I spent about three or four days on it during that, during that week, so you know, it's a fairly small game project. But uh, typical, typical features, so you have ASCII graphics. I, basically, the, the, in these kind of games, using fancy graphics, you just frowned upon, you're cheating. Yeah, none of that. Um, one of the things that is very interesting, they have a lot of random dungeon generation. So these games are typically very replayable because every time you play, it's completely different. Different maps, sometimes different monsters, sometimes different items. You don't really know what you're going to get. So part of the fun of the game is you know, exploring a completely new world every time. Um, they have monsters, obviously, to kill. Um, they have items, so you can pick up items in the dungeon to you know, make your quest easier. Um, it's turn-based, so it's more around tactics and you know, thinking about how you want to play the game rather than speed or reactions. The game basically pauses until you make a move and then everything happens and then you get to pause and make another move. And there's this concept of permadeath, yeah? You, you, you just die and you start again, yeah? So it, 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 it's, a, it's a hardcore game in that sense. Um, um, okay, so that's, that's the quick intro. Um, I'm glad to get out of PowerPoint. We can actually do some, do some closure. So uh, this is the alchemy alchemy project this is by, by the way it's all on github it's all on my github if anyone wants to like download and 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 and, and play with this af afterwards i'm just going to kick this off I, i'll show you a, a trick by the way i often do when i'm doing these kind of kind of projects i often have a a java class yeah um in this case game app dot java it has a sync, just one main function, and all it does is closure.require and closure.eval in order to launch the closure main function. But that means you can package it as a Java app without any fancy, fanciness, yeah, just a standard main class, which means you don't need to AOT anything or anything like that. So it's a nice, it's a nice, it's a nice trick if you, depending on how you want to bundle and package your game. Anyway, um, I'm going to launch it. I'm going to launch it the closure way in the REPL. And I always, I always code my game experiments like this. I start building them at the REPL and then figure out another way to launch them if I need, if I need, if I if I need to. And I'm going to launch it. Hopefully that's going to work. Okay, so this is the game. Welcome to the dungeon, alchemist. Seek the philosopher's stone. I have a little at sign. I can wander around the map. So I'm just using arrow keys here. It's got a few nice features. It's got line of sight calculations. So you can sort of see as the dungeon gets revealed as you walk around it. Um, you can see that the dungeon has got these sort of random features that look a bit like, you know, rock corridors and some, you know, some rooms. What's that? No idea what this, that is. Um, 
I feel refreshed by the healing waters, the fountain dries up. Okay, so I'm an idiot, yeah? I've just, I've just, I've just potentially lost a major advantage. I had a healing fountain. I wasn't even injured. I drank all the healing water. <laughs> Duh. Okay, so I'm probably not, I'm not, probably not going to survive. I'm a, stu- I'm a stupid adventurer. But I've got another healing fountain. Okay, so you know, you, you learn, part of the fun of the role light games is you, f- you figure out what's going on in the world and you, uh, you work out how to take advantage. I know I'm not going to drink that one. I've learnt my lesson. Um, so you wander around the game. Um, oh, there's a goblin. Okay, so this guy is basically, he's got some simple AI. He runs after me. He chases me. He tries to beat me up. If I'm lucky, I escape him. Uh, he's going at the same speed as me, so he's... <laughs> okay, I'm not, I'm not going to run away from him. But if, if, I, if I run myself against the wall, if, if I press dot just to stay still, I wait, the small goblin... He's, try, he's trying to hack me, but he's a bit, he's a bit clumsy. He's not going to do anything. And I say, okay, I'm, I'm, a bit, I'm a bit bored of this. I'm going to bash him. Uh... Small goblin blocks my attack. I hit the small goblin for two damage. He hits me but causes no damage. Miss the small goblin. Oh, this could take ages. <laughs> okay, I've killed him. Yeah. And there's a fair grass we- weed here of some description. So I, so I pick that up. I take the fair grass weed. Let's see what I've got in my inventory. There we are. I've got three magic mushrooms, some craft boot potions, fair grass weed, healing potion. Da, da, da. Okay, so the game's about alchemy, so it's all about collecting potions and mixing <coughs> potions, and you, you're using them to outwit the enemies and, 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 uh, and stuff like that. That cure poison potion may come in useful, so I'm not just going to drink that for fun. Uh, but you get the idea of the game. There's ten levels in the game. There is, in fact, an objective. You can actually play it and you can actually win it um, with a bit, of, a bit of luck and a bit of figuring out how the game works. Um, the, the sort of tradition in roguelike games is that the top level is super easy, but then it gets harder as you go down. So there's some like, quite dangerous monsters if you, if you go a little bit deeper. Uh, okay, so that's the game. Any sort of questions about the game and the sort of concept of the game? How do you draw screen the Super question. Um, actually, um, this is... Well, let's go look at the code. Um, da, 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 da. Redraw screen. Okay, so I'm doing things a bit out of order, but um, but this is the squ- the redrawing for the main screen function. Uh, it takes the state of the game. Uh, you can think of state as the sort of entire in, in, in this context. It means the entire environment. So it's got information about the uh, frame and the, and the sort of the configuration of the screen. It's going to redraw the world, which is basically this part. It's going to redraw the messages, like if something just happened, yeah, in the game, it sends those little messages to say what happened. And it's going to redraw the stats, which are basically the stats about your character, round here at the here at the bottom. Uh, so basically, it's taking that state and it's having three side effects, drawing different parts of the screen. If I go into redraw, redraw world, um, okay, good example. So it's going to, it's going to, it's, this is a, something that's quite common. The entry point is actually here with a state as an input, but in fact, there's another bit of input that I want, another parameter I want, so I'm basically extracting that. In this case, that's the location of the hero. Because it's actually quite important. Where the hero is basically determines how you, where you draw the screen. Uh, the reason it's done this way is because if I wanted to show the screen at a different location, you can use the, 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 second, the second hour tree of the function to draw somewhere else. But normally, you just want to center on the hero. So it's natural that you just extract the hero's location. Uh, Notice this piece here. There's actually the state contains a field called game, and it's actually an atom. So I'm just pulling out the current version from that atom. And this, this game is actually immutable. So the entire actual definition of the game world 
is a single immutable data structure. Uh, the, st the state, as, as the thing called state, has a couple of mutable things inside it, including the, game, the, the definition of the game world, which changes at each, at each game step. Uh, so that's just what we're doing there to pull that out. Um, so we're pulling up a bit of, uh, a bit of information about... We're pulling out the game, we're pulling out the hero, because that's going to affect the rendering and a few different options. Um, we've then got three things that we want to pull out. One is visit, an, an object called, uh, called visibility. That's basically what is visible on the map. We need to know which, which squares we can see or not see. We need the location of the hero again. Um, if there's no location, we use the location of the hero. If there's a location, we keep the location we've been provided. And we also need to know what's been discovered so far. So if you see on, if you see on this map, the bit that's highlighted is basically the bit that's currently visible. Um, the bit which is greyed out has been discovered before, because I've walked around there, but it's not visible currently. Uh, so we need to know the difference between those two different areas. We then figure out some X's and Y's, so the area that needs to be painted. And then we just loop over that area. I won't go into all of the maths, but basically you're just working out what the sort of rectangle of the screen is, so there's an X and a Y loop. And for each location, we're saying, OK, is it visible? If, if and we're working out what the tile is. Is there, a, is there a wall? Is there anything, anything like that? If it's displayable or there's something that you can see, then effectively you're drawing it. And we actually, with a bit of Java interop, I'm actually using a Java class which, impl which emulates a console, so this sort of ASCII console. What I'm doing is I'm working out a foreground color, a background color, and this T is, in fact, the name of a character, what, what character I'm going to draw in ASCII. So I'm setting a background. of JC is the J console, which is like a terminal emulator. I'm setting a foreground, I'm setting a background, and then I'm just drawing a single character at that location. And I'm basically looping over, drawing each of the characters at, across the whole thing. Make sense? So... This is basically the rent part of the rendering, rendering, uh, rendering loop for the game. Um, if I redraw messages, it's doing something similar. Yeah, it's also looking at the content of the uh, at the game, which is current version, so date of the game within the state. It's getting the messages from that, seeing how many uh, messages it's got, and then it's filling an area. Setting foreground and background, and just drawing for each of each of the each of the messages that it wants to display. There's a feature um, I can press M and see like all the messages. Like a me it's got a message log, so you can go back if you're interested or if you've missed something. Answer the question. Yep. So it's all basically the entire the entire thing is a function from the current state of the game to side effects which are basically painting on this on this on this console so you're using the console effective as a canvas do you have any fancy function to draw boxes uh, oh, think, think yeah there's a fill area so this one here oh, okay. so this is filling the area of the console with that's a character so that's space uh, text color and black background. So if I fill with spaces and a black background, I'm basically blanking it out. So I'll see if I can get a message if I run into a wall. Yeah. So what it's doing is it's basically drawing a big black square before drawing the message on top of it. So there's a couple of, there's a couple of utility functions like that which just make some of these things more convenient. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how much of the game world is like predefined as how much is generated? Is it just the maps or to generate like uh, monsters and stuff? Ah, and rules? great question. Um, 
yes, there is randomness. There is randomness throughout the whole thing. The main randomness is in the map generation, but a couple of things uh, I wanted to. Da, 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 da. So this one's this. One of the things I did here, which I think worked quite well, was I factored the gen the generation of the library because basically the, the, every game has like an asset library. Yeah, what are the different objects that exist in the game? What are the different monsters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, yeah, and I basically factored the entire generation of the library into a function at the beginning of the game. Yeah, which is I think an interesting. Uh, interesting approach. Um, let me just see if I can find the entry point. One second. Let me set up. Yeah, okay, this is it. Um, so, this setup is going to basically build an object library, all of the different monsters, all the different items that can possibly exist in the game. Yeah? And what we're actually going to do is we're actually going to sock that into the game itself. So the library of all possible things that can exist in the universe is stored in the universe. Kind of makes sense, yeah? Um, and we run this function build, build lib. Uh, now build lib is basically going to uh, create a big map of all the of all the different possible objects which exist in the world, and it's like it's a map of names to properties. And uh, who's used this as arrow thing? You've used this, yeah. This is super cool, yeah. This is the single most useful function when doing um, this game coding. I found it's like. The, the, the best macro. What it does, um, I'll just do a quick demo. Um, what it does is it lets you um, give a value to a, a symbol. Uh, let's do one, two, three. And let's call that A. Yeah? Now, normally when you're coding, coding code and you define a symbol, you'll have to like redefine A as and then B is A plus something else, and C is B plus something else. And you have to like build a whole bunch of steps, and you have to keep introducing new intermediate variable names. Yeah, That's kind of annoying when, in, a, in these game environments, where you've got this game, which is the state of the universe, every single step, you're going to have to pass the game to it, and you're going to get a new game back. Yeah, So you're always going to have this pattern. Of, of updating the game, getting a new game back. Updating that game, getting a new game back. What this... Okay, let's, let's, let's imagine this is the game, yeah? So let's, let, the game world is a, is a list of one, two, three. I can, you know, conj game... Oops. I can do conj game four. And I get one, oops, I get one, two, three, four, yeah? But it, typically, I'm going to want to do more than one thing in a row, yeah? So I can do conj game 10. And now I get one, two, three, four, ten, yeah? So game, it gets redefined each line, yeah? The first time I'm adding a four, and the next time I'm adding a ten. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, in, in, so basically, you can ha you can build up successive transformations using this this pattern, um, and that's what I'm doing here in the build lib. Yeah, I'm defining the lib to be just this map to start with, with an empty array of objects then I'm going to define all the objects in the lib and then I'm doing a couple of post-processing steps which we don't need to particularly worry about. Define objects I believe uses the same pattern. 
yeah, so then it's going to pass the lib. I didn't use the as thing here. I just used the standard arrow. But define the base, define the tiles, define the effects, define items, define creatures, define hero. So each time it's basically, at, it's basically putting the lib into, as, into, into in, threading it through these, these operations. Let's do, let's look at one of these. Let's look at define items. Define base item. Oh God, there's so many of these things. Um, yeah, okay, so what I'm doing is I'm, I'm, I've got, again, threading through the lib. I have this function called proclaim, yeah? Because uh, it sounded good and a bit archaic for this kind of game. And what that does is it's saying, well, I want a base item to be all the properties of a base thing plus whatever else I specify. So it's almost like... It's almost like prototype-based inheritance. You're basically adding new things to a map. So a base thing has some properties, but I want to add, is item true? I want the default character to be a percent sign. So if I draw one on the map and it's a percent sign, either I meant it to be like that or I've forgotten to change the character. Um, I've got can stack, so can it does this thing stack with other items of the same type? Can I get 10 of the same thing, or will they be separate items? And I have a Z order. So Z order is like which things display on top. If there's many things stacked on the same square, which thing do you want to draw on top? So typically you want to draw a monster on top of some items on the ground. So <laughs> otherwise those sneaky goblins can hide under the rusty coin on the floor, and that wouldn't be quite right. Um, but then, I, then, then the other items are then based on, are based on that. Yeah? Oops. So I scale down. So once I've got... Because it's threading through, it's add, each of these proclaims is adding to the map. So by the time I've got down to this point, base item already exists, and I'm creating a base potion, which is built on top of base item. So this has some extra properties. It's is potion is true. You know the recipe. The character is a little exclamation mark. Um, let me drop one of my potions. E. Yeah, the exclamation mark. That's a that's a, a potion on the ground. Yeah. If I stand over it, there's a healing potion here. Um, and then what I do is, um, I have some functions which some some properties in the maps which are actually functions. Yeah. So I have an on consume. What happens when you consume a base potion? It doesn't actually do much. It just says the potion tastes, tastes horrible. But these are the functions that actually get invoked when you, when you carry out an action with, with the item. So what I'm actually doing is I'm building up the code in t inside the library object, which is a data structure which describes how um, all the different items work in the game. And then the game will end up referring to these and it can actually execute these, these scripts. This is, a, this is, I find, a much better way of coding games is to actually put your logic in the thing that you're designing. Yeah, here I'm designing how a potion behaves. So I want both the properties and the logic related to the potion in, in, the, same, in the same place. Otherwise, it would get scattered across the code. And there's quite a lot of items in a typical game. This is quite small in some, some, some senses. Um, and there's a, there's, you can see there's all different kinds of... Um, kinds of uh, um, items. One of the things it does do is it, um, it randomizes the colors of the potions. Yeah, so there's a bunch of different potion colors and it assigns random po potion colors. So the idea is that you don't necessarily know what a blue potion is until you've tasted it. Yeah, so you either need to take a risk and drink the potion and discover what it is. Um, or you find some other way of identifying it. So that's part of the, you know, the, the strategy of the game is do you risk drinking a potion because it might be useful or you know, do you want to try and save it or try and identify it later, etc. Um, so that's an example where the randomness actually gets inserted in the, world, in the generation of the items, which I think was the original, <laughs> original question. Uh, but it's a bit of, you know, I just wanted to give context of how this works, yeah? So that randomness basically alters the library, and then the rest of the game, the rest of the game will run with a blue potion being a healing potion. But the next time, a, blue, a red potion could be a healing potion. 
So as a player, you can't learn the potion colours to give yourself an advantage in the next game because it's going to be different. <laughs> yeah. You have uh, walkthroughs on online. Well, yeah, exactly. You know, this, this not, no, no walkthroughs for this game. It's just guaranteed to be different every time. Um, and there's a bunch of other there's a bunch of other things around around that. Um, what's what's quite interesting is um, I found a way to make the actual definitions of potions uh, really really small. Yeah, and I was quite pleased with this. Yeah, so th I think this is about as simple a definition as you could get. So a regeneration potion. It's descends from a base potion, so I'm defining the inheritance. I'm saying what level is, I think the level is when it starts to appear. Does it start, does it start to appear at, uh, it starts to appear at a random level between one and eight or something like that. So where, where you find it in the dungeon. And the only other thing I specify is what happens on consume. And the only thing that you need to specify for on consume is it's a potion effect function which means an, a, a potion will add an effect to the character, and the effect is called regenerating. Yeah? And that's, that is all you need to create a, a complete potion in, in, in this game. Yeah? And if, you, if I copied those three lines and I pasted those three lines and changed it to a foobar potion, you would get a foobar potion in the game. Yeah? And it would get generated at level random 1 to 8 or, or what, whatever, whatever it is. Um, and the effects themselves are defined. So the effects are objects in their own right. Um, define base effects. Yeah, so there's like periodic effects. So if you're, point, if you're healing, for example, you can regenerate some life over time as you walk around the, around the map. Poison will take away life over time as you walk away the map. And that's all specified in this library. So a lot of the complexity basically gets put in the definitions of the, of, of the objects in, in the game. How am I doing for time? Ten minutes, please. Ten minutes, okay? Cool. Um, Okay, so that's, that's the library, the, ge the, the, the library um, generation piece. There's also a dungeon generation piece. Uh, this is actually what creates the, um, creates the world. Um, yeah, I think this is the entry point. Um, and it's using... It's using my own version of the, um, the as macro which basically does exactly the same thing but if a nil gets returned it bails out yeah so it's like an and yeah as long as it keeps returning something which is toothy it'll it'll keep going but if a nil ever happens it stops now that's useful because sometimes random dungeon generation can fail yeah like imagine the situation where um you can't you've somehow created a whole bunch of block squares and you can't place the finishing point at any point that the, hum that the hero can ever get to. Uh, it's basically failed to create a successful, successful dungeon. So you have to bail out and try again. It's very rare, but it does happen. So what we ha this and as macro basically means you can bail out by returning nil if you go, hey, I couldn't find a, couldn't find a route through the dungeon. Yeah? So that means that the, the dungeon is always guaranteed to be completable. Um, it also is a bit more efficient if there's, if there's potential for failure. Um, but yeah, it's basically creating a game. It's defining the volume. It starts off actually filling the entire space. It's a 3D space. It fills it with a rock wall. And then it actually starts hollowing things out to actually create the different, um, different, the different caves and items. So it generates the region, which is the entire region to start with. It places an exit staircase, which you need to finish the game. And it places the Philosopher's Stone, which you need to um, reach to win the game. So basically you have to go down to the 10th level, find the Philosopher's Stone, get back up to the first level, and then, then escape out the exit staircase. So those are the only two things, in fact, that absolutely have to exist in the game and have to be connected. It decorates the rooms. So rooms get generated in 
earlier stages, but they don't have anything in them. Uh, what it does at this step is it then adds features and things to rooms like fountains or pillars or, or pools or this kind of thing just to give the game a bit more scenery. And then it does, um, it does connect levels, which is basically adding staircases between the levels so that you can go between them. Um, and it, I do that twice because I want enough staircases that you've, you're not searching around for the only one and only way of going up and down. It gets a bit boring if you have to go... So just to make the game a bit more dynamic. Um, but I could have done that a random numbers of times or I could have had some different probabilities in there. But, you know, you want the game to have enough connectivity that you can actually explore the map. Um, generate region... Um, Basically, it just so it's a 3D space, it basically loops over the Z levels and generates each level one by one because each level's potentially got some slightly different features. So it calls generate level. Um, it's doing a reduce actually. So, um, what it's doing is it's, it's just reducing over the, the range of the levels, the Z levels of each dungeon level, and each iteration of the reduce is simply generating the next floor so that the game gets updated with a new floor each each time it runs through uh, generate level is uh, do, 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 do. Uh, there's something around a, there's something around a creating an un, there's something around creating an underground stream sometimes optionally but Generally, it's doing these generate zones, and a generate zone is what it's actually doing is quite interesting. It's recursively splitting. So there's this split direction. It's recursively splitting the level into sub areas, so you sort of get like this sort of fractal layout of of, of rooms in or areas zones in the level. Um, let's see if we can see that in the map. Yeah, so you can probably see it a little bit here. Um, yeah, so you can see this long wall here. This was probably a zone split between this part of the dungeon and this part of the dungeon. Likewise here, that's a long wall here, it was probably a zone split between this part of the dungeon and this part of the dungeon. So what it does is it subdivides the, dun the dungeon into different areas, each, each level into different areas as it generates it. And that basically enables you to break down the problem into defining smaller areas. And then once it gets to the lowest level, it decides, OK, randomly, is this going to be a, a room? Or is it going to be like a rocky area with a tunnel inside? Or is it going to be a, a room with a pool inside? Et cetera, et cetera, yeah? And that basically it enables it to generate this sort of you know variety in map in, in, in map layouts. There's a bunch of different techniques you can use to generate levels, but you know that's one I found that was quite quite fun to play with and quite quite efficient for this kind of this kind of game. Um, but again, there's some randomness in here, yeah. So the world generation is not entirely a pure function. It's 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 doing some um, doing some random random splits of the map. Okay. I think I'm probably running out of time. Are there any 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 more questions on stuff that? Yeah. There's so many objects in your game. How did you did you come up with did, did you plan everything out up front or did you go along as you went along you just modified in, the object? In terms of the objects in the library. Um, the the many maps that you have. These maps. The uh, the maps that... Yeah. So. Um, I started with some ideas around, okay, what are, what are common properties I knew I was going to have, yeah? So, like, one of the things I knew that, like, is blocking, yeah? Is it something which will block the movement of, of the hero? Like, a wall blocks the hero, but um, a bit of grass on the ground doesn't, yeah? So, there's some properties I knew that I was likely to need, yeah, which helped me, like, decide what the map keys were going to be. But then a lot of this I actually added as I was uh, experimenting with the game. So, you know, the, my thought process was, well, some of these rooms are a bit boring. What shall I put in a room? What might you find in a sort of hidden underground room? I don't know, a torture rack, yeah? I'll make a torture rack. 
Yeah? So I found an ASCII character that looks suitably evil and torture rack like. Um, let me find it. There you are. So it's a torture rack. It's, uh, it descends from base decoration. It has char OX4C1. And the foreground colour is COCOCO is a yellow. No, a white. A light, a light grey. Yeah. So that's a torture rack. So that was... And then I think somewhere in the dungeon generation, I specified some kinds of rooms would get a t torture rack in or something like that. But, um, you know, that's enough to create a new item in the game. So one of the great things about Closure was it made it really... And, and playing in the REPL, I didn't have to reboot the game. I could do this, you know, pretty much with two REPL commands and test it out, yeah? One of the things that was so great about Closure is it made it so easy to play with adding things to the game like, 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 like this as you go through. And to me, that's part of the fun of game development. You don't have to plan the whole thing out. As long as you start with a good framework and a good conceptual idea of the game, you can add so much of this stuff as you, as, as, you, as, you, as you go along. And that was fun. This was the fun part of the game, was just going through and saying, ooh, what, what, what if I want a rat? Yeah, let's make a rat. You know, make a giant rat. Can I have a dragon? Yeah, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is what's fun. And if, if, the two, if you can get things in a way and sort of... It's the case, I think, of, of moulding the language to support my way of thinking. And my way of thinking was very much, I want to experiment. I want to be able to define new game objects very easily. So I want to basically create a DSL, almost, which is going to enable efficient um, definition of game objects. And I think that worked quite, quite well in this game. So. Have you tried to use other languages to create some games? Yeah, I've, I've written games in a few languages. I, I, a long time ago, I used to write in Delphi. <laughs> okay. Pascal, Turbo Pascal. I've done some C++, C++ Basic. But I originally learned coding in Basic. Um, I've done some games in Java. Um, yeah, a mix, a mix of things. I mean, Closures, I think, has been the most fun. I've written some more sophisticated things as well, like some OpenGL stuff and this kind of thing, which is... But this is actually fun because it shows, I think, shows more of the language, whereas talking about OpenGL is, you know, more about maths and, <laughs> <laughs> render, re and shape, pixel shaders, which are, you know, less of a closure thing. This is actually a, a nice example of, 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 of using closure. But, uh, yeah, I've tried a few different languages, and closure's, closure's pretty much my favourite um, of all the languages I've used for, for gaming. Um, it's a good language. Immutable data structures actually are surprisingly good for gaming. If I have time, I'll show you one, one little trick. Um, so remember this, remember this position, okay? Um, I'm just going to run this. Um, so I'm, I'm basically getting the current state of the game. I'm just going to store that in a, in a var. So original G is basically the current state of the game. I am going to run around somewhere else. I'm going to drink my fountain. There you are. Fountain's empty. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to reset the game in the Atom to the original game. So it's persistent data structure it should have the old version of the data here. Ah, well, that's because I forgot to, whoops, forgot to withdraw the screen. I've changed the data structure in memory, but I haven't actually, haven't actually changed it on screen. And I'm back. And I go down, and my fountain is refreshed. <laughs> Uh, and it, so you've got this time travel ability that's, you know, it, it's, 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 it's fun to play. Uh, there's actually somewhere that you can find a time travel potion that basically memorises the point at which you drink it and then teleports back to it at some other point. <laughs> there's some random stuff like that, some, some little Easter eggs hidden, hidden in there. Um, but yeah, that kind of stuff is great for just, a, just some experimental design. Anyway, I think I've probably used up all my time, but hopefully that was interesting and... Uh, um, if you want to play with the code, it's all up on GitHub, so um, yeah, have a hack. <laughs> <laughs>